Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens, and this is Carly Stevens Books for All Things Writing, Publishing, and Indie Author Life. And I have the privilege to speak to Paulette Golden um, today. So hi, Paulette. Hello. Thank you for well, having me. Welcome to welcome to the channel. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure. Paulette writes historical romances that give voice to the outliers and survivors, the wallflowers, and overshadowed. With her sensual portrayal of love and historical authenticity, she promises enchanting immersion in Georgian England from Moors to Moorlands. She holds a PhD, MA, and BA in specializations including Georgian and Victorian era British lit, Arthurian legends, rhetoric, and creative and professional writing. After establishing her career as a university professor and seasoned speaker, keynotes, conferences, workshops, commencements, and more, she learned from an oncologist that she had only three months to live. And so she did. She aimed to survive by writing her first novel, a novel she claims saved her life. While she wrote to live, she now lives to write. That bio just, it, it really, it gets me right here. Um... Yeah, so I, I'm so excited to dive into our topic today, which is uh, Regency England and the things people get wrong. Um, so just to kind of kick things off, tell us a little more about your um, personal and writing background um, that makes you the right person to talk about Regency England. Okay, well, the short answer to this is I have access to Doctor Who's TARDIS, and I can time travel anytime I want for the most authentic of all experiences. I invite one to two readers along with me each trip. <laughs> so how, how does one sign up for this? <laughs> it sounds like I a thrilling you experience. On the list. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, all joking aside, I have studied and researched this uh, for decades. I've also taught it for, for decades. My, um, the, oh, I shouldn't confess this. My first university class that I taught was in 1999. So hopefully I don't quite look my age. Um, but uh, I do hold, uh, you've already, you already said the, the bachelor's and master's and the doctorate. Um, mm -hmm. And I was trained specifically in research methodology mm -hmm. and literary analysis, especially contextualizing the literature. I did spend a portion of grad school in England uh, studying under established scholars in the field. Um, if you wanted to look up, for example, Ronald Hutton, he was one of the scholars that I that I uh, studied under and made quite quite an impact. Um, but I think above the 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 academic, beyond the academic, that that's almost sort of the 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 the, the icing on the cake, the whipped cream on 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 the the, the ice cream there, where. Um, what really matters, I think, is is my passion, my passion for all things Georgian. Um, you study a lot of things in college, and, and what really struck me was the Georgian era, and I can't get enough. So I want every opportunity to time travel that I can, be it reading about the era, um, researching about the era, or now writing the era, actually immersing myself in the, in the, in the era by my own writing. Um, and and something that I really love about it is, uh, I guess the main driver is is the whole age of enlightenment, um, mm -hmm. where you have sense over sensibility, the the, the reason over the emotion. Um, and while I may seem like a very emotional person because I'm kind of, uh, I don't know, peppy and enthusiastic, um, <laughs> I'm actually more of the practical, reasonable, uh, reasonable, um, logical person. Uh, and, and, and the joke is I'm a little bit more like Dr. Spock than anyone. And it's weird because here I am smiling, not looking remotely like Dr. Spock. Um, but in terms of thinking and approaching, uh, I'm definitely sense over sensibility. So I I connect more to the to the age of enlightenment, um, but there's there's just so much there's so much to love about it. This is our last agrarian society. Mm. Uh, <laughs> how can you not fall in love with that? Uh, the values were different. The the the, the social um, spheres were different. Even the food, even the food was different. Now I've seen some of those menus. I don't necessarily want to eat the food, but it's still <laughs> You'll exciting. Bring snacks in the it's in the tartars and in the tartars we have snacks. <laughs> We come prepared. Um, so there was definitely a sense of, of, of British pride um, and a development of British identity. Uh, and, and that's, that's uh, I think, really the first time we see that where um, once the French Revolution happens, you know, we just overthrow everything um, of the continent because before it was like that, that starry eyed sort of, um, oh, we love the French fashion. We love the French um, everything, their, their, their behaviors and etiquette. And we finally get this sense of, 
of British pride after we we can turn away and say, so who are we? Um, and we develop that during during the era. So hopefully in my writing, um, I bring that. I bring that kind of immersion. I bring that kind of often authenticity. But um, yeah, so it seems kind of strange, I guess, to to say that that's what qualifies me as being a professional um, voice for the era. But I, I really think that that uh, you know degrees aside, I think that that's that's important is having is having a real love for for the era and being able to capture everything that that makes it what it is. <laughs> and of course, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. So every time I research something, I face palm or you know <laughs> flip the table and say, "How did I not know this?" <laughs> but it's one of the beautiful things too, right? Like the more you dig into something, and the more you realize that there is. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's, that's strange at all. Not, not only do you have that academic side, um, you know, the qualifications, but um, you being a teacher, you know, there's a difference between the person who just was able to pass or get a grade and the person who has that genuine curiosity. And the one who has the genuine curiosity and love is going to get way more out of a class than the person who just, you know, um, only follows directions and things like that. So I think it absolutely does qualify you to um to speak about this on a different on a different level um so most of us are not where you are and you know obsessed with this period and really digging into all of the research um so for anybody who doesn't already know what exactly is the regency era your your books it said in your bio are set in the georgian era are those the same are those different do they overlap can you um shed some light on that Right, sure. Um, this is one of those, I guess, misconception moments where uh, nobody really has a clue <laughs> where these where these things lie, and so they call the Georgian. I mean, era, I mean era era and, there's know. always some there's always some gray area because it's not like you wake up the next year and you're like, I've arrived at the next. Um, but you can you can get a sense, you know, what approximately. Right. So. Um, the Regency era is the Georgian era, but the Georgian era isn't necessarily the, 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 the Regency era. So the Georgian era is the big, long picture. So this lasted uh, 123 years. Um, mm -hmm. So we're looking at early 18th century. Um, don't quote me on this. 1714 is the date that comes to mind. But, you know, um, so 1714 all the way to 1837. So Queen Victoria oh. was crowned 1837, and there ends the Georgian era. So 123, 123 years. Um, it's There's called a tremendous the Georgian era. amount that happened during that time. I'm thinking right? about literary eras because that's my, that's oh yes, or my expertise and the the amount of change that happened between you know in that time is is uh, kind of staggering. Okay, so that's the the and Georgian era, that whole you know? span. All right. Yeah. So we've got the whole span is the Georgian era and it was called the Georgian era because all of the kings were King George. Um, so it was King George I, King George II, King George III, finally King George IV. Now poor King William IV gets lumped into the Georgian era. He, uh, he was of the family. He just decided he didn't want to be King George V, I guess. Um, and he only ruled for seven years. So it, it is lumped into the Georgian era, even though he he wasn't technically King George V. Um, <laughs> So it was all King George's, and, and it's a very simple way to call, I mean, kind of like, you know, the Victorian era named after Queen Victoria. So it's a pretty easy classification. Um, the Regency, interestingly enough, was only nine years of the 123-year span. And the nine years was 1811 to 1820, and that was it. And that was when um, the Prince of Wales had to exercise sovereignty. He was, he was granted rights to be... Um, prince regent and take over for dad so uh that's it 1811 to 1820 um now what ends up happening is people will flex that a little bit and they'll stretch that and while it's technically not officially on record the regency era i think there's ample justification to kind of clump it in um so about 1788 or so, uh, King George III was having fewer lucid moments than he was having lucid moments. He was still with us. He was still with us. He had good days. Um, he had good days, but he had more bad days than good days. And so the Prince of Regent was more and you know more often than not having to step up, do the speeches, do the do, take on the duties. Um, but it, but there were enough lucid moments not to be able to um, name him Prince Regent. 
he was just sort of acting on dad's behalf when he when he needed to but that was throughout the 1790s that was throughout the age i mean you got a 20 year span there before he was officially named prince regent um where he was taking over for daddy um and somewhere people are rolling in their grave because i'm calling king george the third daddy but you know <laughs> perspective perspective um so there's a 20 year period it is not the regency it is not the regency era but the prince of wales who would be regent was acting more and more in that regent role um so i think there, there's justification whenever folks are you know sort of erroneously calling say the 1790s or the early 1800s regency I, I think that's fine um and then you even have once the prince of wales is is crown king he's no longer prince regent he is king he is king george the fourth um for a short period of time but that 1820 to 1830 well while he's ruling people still kind of call that the regency era well there's no regent he's king now but you know how do you how do you get out of your head you've known him for the as as a prince regent for so long it's like oh he's still pretty to us though um so I would say like about 1790 to, to, to 1830, um, people tend to think of as the Regency, even though it was only technically that little nine year period. Um, but it is the whole Georgian era. And, and and so when I say I write in the Georgian era, there can be some confusion where people are like, oh, you're, you're writing in the era of, um, say, the big wigs and the, the, the panniers. And it's like, no, that's that's actually the Georgian era. <laughs> I just, I tend to write around, I mean, it's still the Regency area. I, I tend to write around the Regency rather than in the Regency. Um, so I, I stick with the safe, the safe Georgian, Georgian England rather than um, calling it Regency. So a long, a long involved answer, but there, there it is. <laughs> that is, that is very surprising to me because, uh, you know, I, I would need to double check, but didn't Jane Austen, who's like the poster child of Regency romance and that kind of thing, um, didn't she write in the 1790s or have some of oh, her yes. some of her so things her come out then? Was pre-regency. She was writing it. Um, the publications of her later novels weren't until after the regency, but she was she was very solidly writing and representing. So any 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 etiquette we see, any behaviors, any events, any fashion, anything that's mentioned in her books is representative of pre-regency um the 1790s the early 1800s and so it's it's funny because she really is the post the poster child for the regency era right and it's like, so yeah. she published after but yeah, it's okay that's okay <laughs> huh. um so since you since you clearly um you know understand the just the nuances of this um what are some of the most common mistakes or misconceptions that you encounter with the regency era as this um this interview goes out the the finale of the latest season of Bridgerton has just dropped <laughs> and I feel like Bridgerton is kind of like like the renaissance festival you know fun but inaccurate version of the time so can anyway can you can you dig into some some common mistakes or misconceptions people make about regency okay okay well we just hit on <laughs> you don't one, have which to focus on Bridgerton or anything but <laughs> But uh, it's, you know, it's on the brain. I just saw the first part of the latest season. <laughs> well, you know, since you mentioned that, I think we'll, 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 we'll circle back. We'll circle back and, and touch on that. I think that's important. Um, and actually, no, no, no. In fact, let's kind of lead with, lead with that and then we'll circle back. So leading with that, would I shock you to your toes to tell you that most of the, 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 the common mistakes, the common misrepresentations that we see in, in this genre um, are intentional or even canon. <laughs> so intentional or intentional or can you explain what you mean by that? Like I can, I can, but um, we'll lead with that. We'll lead with that as a teaser. Okay. And then we'll circle back. And then we'll circle back. So now that I've shocked you, you want to know more. Let's go ahead and get those unintentional mistakes out of the way. And then we can circle back and kind of pick on, we won't pick on Bridgerton, but but we'll we'll let it be, we'll let it be the um, you know, the the, the elephant in the room that we can kind of, you know, poke at and maybe analyze it as midge. Okay. Right, right, just a little bit. So there are there are unintentional mistakes. Um, and any author can make these. I mean, from from the novice with their debut, you know, they're really enthusiastic, but they they're just not as acquainted as they they could be. Um, all the way to experienced authors who maybe they're out of touch with the research, or maybe they've forgotten, or whatever. There, there are unintentional mistakes, and um, those unintentional mistakes are often similar. 
across across you know different um all these different books they're 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 uh you'll see them time and time again so um one of the first ones that that comes to mind is forms of address uh something as simple as calling a duke my lord hmm. um calling a uh okay think of these on the fly oh, calling the daughter of an aristocrat um say lady featherstone um where where it's it's like well, no you've just given her the name of the wife but 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 thanks for playing um so forms of address things like these it kind of rankle me where uh you can look these up so easily there there are there are charts about this now i realize it's confusing um it's confusing even if you're living in the culture uh mm -hmm. unless you're unless you're encountering aristocracy every single day of your life which you're not going to unless you are yourself you know an aristocrat and even then you're probably still going to get some of the some of it wrong but there are charts so i've seen um, these charts i've looked up these charts <laughs> you know writers we do this exactly exactly so you can find these you can find these um so another one I've got I've got I've got some I've got some common I've got some some common mistakes in my head so we're just gonna we're gonna kind of go go through them so forms of address um etiquette and behavior there are some etiquette and behavior common mistakes um such as something as simple as when to bow and curtsy and when not you know a lot of writers are just we're bowing and curtsying all over the place um, or even how we bow and curtsy. Um, that can be a, a, you know, a simple, a simple mistake all the way to an over-familiarization, um, with strangers. You know, you see a stranger on the, on the street and you're like, Hey, how are you doing? And you're going, Oh gosh, Oh, heavens no. Oh, that's, that's the wrong etiquette or behavior. Um, so some of that will come in, you know, to egregious areas, errors to, uh, small errors. Um, a big one, in addition to forms of address, I guess etiquette was kind of a small one. A big one would be the inheritance laws. And that's usually a plot point, and that's why it's a big one. It's usually used as a plot point, and then if you get it wrong, it's like the whole plot's wrong. Um, we see this usually in entailments, specifically with the aristocratic titles, and uh, with the primogeniture, the, the the concept of of who's going to um, inherit the the eldest son always inheriting, and that's the eldest son of the eldest son of the eldest. Like, is a very very direct line you know forget the brothers um they don't exist uh it is direct line um but a plot point for an example that we'll see that goes terribly wrong would be an aristocrat um planning to disinherit his heir and give the title to the younger son and then the world face palms because you can't do that you um, can't there's no legal action that was no, available you, at the time? That. you cannot do that um the heir is going to inherit no matter what unless the heir dies in which case the younger brother still isn't going to get it because it's going to be the son of the heir um unless the son doesn't have an heir but it, it, there are very strict laws so we see these inheritance laws um often mistaken so forms of address um inheritance laws the more lighter you know etiquette and 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 behavior um servants servant roles and duties uh they often get kind of confused and you have say the butler doing what the footman would do what the footman doing what the butler would do that kind of thing um as well as even over familiarization like um let's all be friends we're friends we're friends with our servants it's like that's not even a thing now all these centuries later that's that that's still not a thing um so you're not gonna be buddy buddy with your with your with your with your with your lady's maid i'm sorry um Hmm. So, uh, okay. Okay. Well, nope. Um, let's add, let's add this. And then, and then I'm going to come back to the intentional in the Bridgerton. Um, I'm going to pick on, I'm going to pick on the Bridgerton. So th these aren't so much, um, mistakes as misrepresentation. I would say British culture itself can be really misrepresented. Um, and this is not just to American writers making Americanism. This, this is any anyone. Um, an Australian writer can can misrepresent the British culture. And usually it's just an unfamiliarity of the culture. It's not intentional. It's like I'm, I'm gonna sit here and massacre the British culture. No, it's just it's just lack of exposure, lack of understanding. Um, they haven't spent a lot of time in England or they don't have any English friends or relatives. And so the information that they're getting is mostly from the books. Um so then it just kind of feeds further 
further misrepresentation. Right. Um, when you said that it was very similar mistakes made time after time, oh, I yeah. thought that ha- that's exactly the reason you see it and you think this has been vetted by by someone, surely. So I'll just carry it on. So I'm going to piggyback on that very moment, or that very thing in just a moment. So I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. Um, yes, that is exactly what happens. So you're getting your information from the, 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 previous, um, the, the, the previous author that you read. So the British culture misrepresentation is, is, is a big thing. And, and what's really funny is sometimes you can see this even by British writers and you're going, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> like what happened? What social circles are you in? <laughs> it happens. Um, we also have sort of that modern, the modern perspective are, we, we bring with us when we write all the things that we have learned and observed and experienced. So, you know, we have a feminist heroine before feminism was was a thing. We've got a hero psychoanalyzing the people around him using Freudian theories. Hmm. But uh, <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't a thing yet. Um, and so that happens. And, you know, these are all unintentional. They're, they're, it's baggage that we carry with us that we have to unlearn. Um, if you will, or have a really good editor who is going to unlearn it for us. <laughs> um, and there's always anachronisms, um, but those are so those are so small and so random. You know, you have a you have a rose in the garden before the rose was a garden. Um, I think we were kind of kind of chatting about that over over email. It, those little things are they're things that you learn as you go, and 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 few people are going to notice them unless they're really watching for them. It's it's the big things like the form of address that can really can really trip you up. Um, mm-hmm. So speaking of seeing it from other writers, since you opened that can of worms, a lot of these mistakes have become canon. They have been not so just repeated, overused. but but canon. That's a canon. that's a significant word. Please do go on. <laughs> canon, yeah. So it is it is part of the body of literature now. It is part of the world build. It is an accepted an even desired part of that world. So something that has been so misused for so long, the readers expect it. It is part of that world. Um, I've got an example. I, I was told, example. I was I was waiting. Like, what what is it that I've wanted from like Regency stories here. that is right that's incorrect? Oh, it, you know, a little a lot of a lot of word. It's usually word usage more than anything. Word usage, terminology, idioms that we might see. Um, but one of the, 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 the most common um, that you'll see is tone. So you're a member of the tone. Um, and, and I've been seeing this a lot. Speaking of Bridgerton, this is your fault now that you brought it up. Um, I've been seeing this a lot on social media where like even the National Trust is is like, hey, check out this estate where where, you know, the 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 Bridgerton tone ap- uh, appear. And I'm like, oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> so. Like it is, it is been so misused that it, it, we expect it. It is part of that world. Um, so specifically with, with that, that particular word, word, how it's usually referenced, not always, but how it's usually referenced in these books is to the upper 10,000. Um, this idea of this upper echelon, specifically the upper 10,000. Um, and there was no such thing <laughs> as an upper 10,000. The, the, even the, the term upper 10,000, the concept, the upper 10,000 wasn't coined until 1850s. Uh, well, I think it was technically 1840 something. Um, then it was popularized in the 1850s, but it was an Americanism to describe wealthy New Yorkers. It had nothing to do with England or aristocrats or anything else. Um, where, where the term is actually coming from and how you could correctly use it is for the Tone. Uh, many apologies for my poor French pronunciation. Somewhere, somebody is flipping a table. Um, but the haut tone would be correct. And that refers to high fashion. You're fashionable. Um, le beau tone would also work. And that's referring to good manners. So you have really good manners. Um, so if somebody was, instead of saying a member of the tone, which you can't be a member of the tone because there's no such thing, um, you could say instead somebody has good tone and if they have good tone then that means that they're fashionable and well-mannered so yeah i want to date somebody who's you know who 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 has good tone they're fashionable they have good manners um correct usage but it's been used incorrectly so long that it is part it is it it like you wouldn't have a regency novel without mention of it Hmm. um to the point that you're seeing it on social media (laughs) 
so you, you've got you've got things like that, that that are actually canon but um i think i think where where we should go next is the intentional the intentional use of mistakes so something like tone it wouldn't be intentionally misused it's it's just part of the world so you're not sitting there going i know this is wrong and i'm using it anyway you're using it how it's been used in every book prior and, and you're you're assuming they know what they're doing um but there are the intentional mistakes i.e bridgerton um let's hope julia quinn never watches this interview she's gonna send me some some mail like come on leave me be <laughs> i'm sure she's heard it all it's fine <laughs> right and it's like oh oh you know get over yourself julia i've been i've been reading you since well before the movie you're fine <laughs> you're, you're fine mad respect um so and, and she's gonna get she you know she's gonna get front row and center in my little my little intentional mistakes have been made um uh speech here from my little soapbox she's gonna get get a nice a nice nice front row center um compliments here um no no beating over the head for the mistakes definitely compliments so I'm gonna make this up but you're gonna get where I'm going with it so let me let me first just establish this is completely fictionalized this is me making something up to make a point as, as an illustration of what people do for intentional mistakes okay exactly exactly so um i'm going to create three categories and kind of explain where the stories fit in in terms of intentional mistakes but they are fictionalized so i don't want anybody to like run off and and start you know pull up their search browser and start looking up it's like i have made these up these are these are illustration purposes only um but you'll get where i'm going you'll get where i'm going so um, in terms of accuracy, in terms of accuracy and and intentional mistakes, we're not dealing with the unintentional, the the, the novice writers or whatnot. Um, we're dealing with people who are who are set to write accurate books or not accurate, or you know they're 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 intentionally writing inaccurate books. Um, you've got three categories. It's on a spectrum, so a little you can you can be somewhere in that category of these spectrums. You got the purists. There's my first fictional category: purists. You got the historians, my second completely fictionalized category, historians. And then you've got the, what do we want to call it? Fantasy landers. <laughs> you mentioned the Renaissance festival, like, like fantasy land here. Um, so you, you, you've got purists, historians, fantasy landers. We can call these guys anything, anything you want. And I'm sure somewhere, you know, some authors are either going to going to say, yeah, I fit there, or they're going to say, um, that's not me. That's a terrible, you know, terrible representation of how we write. Just bear with me. It's, it's an illustration only. Uh, and it's coming out of my head. So I'm sorry. <laughs> my head is a scary place. When you have a TARDIS, you see things, you know, you see things, you experience things, and this is what happens. You end up with fictionalized categories. So the purists are the ones that are building an accurate world. The historians are the ones who are be who are building an immersive but familiar and believable world. The fantasy landers or anything goes, it's modern regency, modern regency world. But they have built these worlds. They are completely immersive, and they are what their readers want. Um, these are the ideal. The they they have targeted their their ideal readers, and the readers rarely cross over. A purist isn't going to read something from from the fantasy land. The fantasy land isn't going to read from the purists. Um, you you are giving what what those particular readers desire. So so I'm sorry. What's the difference between the purist and the historian? One more time. Oh okay. So all right. Yeah. Yes. All right. So the purists. Let's kind of delve into this a little a little deeper. So um, the purists. They are writing a story that is straight out of the Georgian era. This could have been a book that was taken off of Jane Austen's bookshelf. Um, the word usage, the etiquette, the, the, the representation of the laws, um, absolutely everything, sentence structure, the, the, the voice of the era. Um, I mean, you could, you could read a Jane Austen book, get the voice, read one of their books, it's the same voice. And, and this is really uh, specific for those readers who want more Jane Austen. They're not watching the movies. They're reading Jane Austen. They want more Jane Austen and they're bummed there aren't more books. So behold, you have plenty of writers who are writing more Jane Austen books. I mean, I'm sure they, you know, somewhere that they're like, well, I'm not Jane Austen, but you know, you get, you get that, 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 that idea of um, it is, it is so, so truly authentic um, to the point that the narrative itself 
Um, and we're not talking the dialogue. We're not talking, I mean, we are talking the narrative sentence structure and word choice. If the word didn't exist, okay, wait, nope, I have a, I have an example. Um, let's say hero and hero, uh, hero and hero when are talking, hero says something, the hero and thinks, I need to process what he said. Process didn't happen until computers were invented. This word, this word didn't exist. Jane Austen would have never processed anything. So to our modern reading, it's like, well, I, I get it, but come on. I mean, right, something instead, to say, somebody something would needs. recuse themselves to consider the words or something like that instead. Yeah. So, so a purist isn't going to, they're, they're not going to use a word like that because it wasn't true to the time. They're going to stick to only the words that were available in the time. Um, but you're going to have readers who don't like it because it sounds archaic. It's not accessible. Um, and then you have the ones that that's all they're going to read because they do want, they do want the accurate. So historians, so you ask the difference between the, the historian, then we can bop over there to Bridger, Bridgerton land. Um, so the historian is the one who wants to be um, as accurate as possible as few anachronisms as possible. Um, and even if they have an anachronism in their in their book, they're going to fix it for the next one once they learn better. Um, but it's it's as accurate as possible, but it's written for a modern audience. Um, Jane Austen would probably stumble all over the sentence structure. It's a modern sen sentence structure. Um, even the dialogue could contain um, modern words. So, uh, kappa. Kappa is a good example. I've been called out for using kappa. Um, kappa is something that it's familiar. It's familiar to us. It's something we would use. It's something um, any modern Brit is going to say on any given day. And so you're reading, you're reading a book, you're, you're, you're time traveling in this book, you're completely immersed in another era, and you see the word kappa. The purists are going to find that jarring. Um, the other readers are going to say oh something relatable something familiar something comfortable and it's it's that 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 comfort in an unfamiliar world um and i imagine that the storytelling structure would be very different too because if you read jane austen it's it's pretty omniscient and distant and the you know modern taste has moved largely away from that to something that's more you know either limited third person or first person or um something like that so you're saying that the historian would be more likely to use modern storytelling techniques with yes. accurate information and the purist is is something that is from from the time right okay. right right so they wouldn't have say um, a deep point of view i mean unless they right. were writing you know uh, an epistolary um style they're not going to have deep point of view um whereas say this this historian that i've, that I've made up um that kind of writer is going to have say something like deep point of view or or whatever whatever narrative style that that a modern reader would be able to relate to and it's really just all about that relatability so you've got um accuracy you've got authenticity you've got immersion but with the familiarity and relatability so they're they're that mm -hmm. middle ground there i'm i'm i'm, I'm dipping my my feet into both 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 streams here. I've got the I've got the purist in me a little bit, but I've also got the the fantasy kind of going on. Um, but then you have the, the 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 fantasy landers. The majority. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and take a leap here and say the majority of the Regency era uh, romances um, are fantasy. Um, and and it's it, this is not. And and when I when I emphasize the intentionality, this this is not say people ignorant of the time. They know the time. They have researched the time. They have done this. I mean, these are these are skilled. These are knowledgeable. These are educated. Most of these authors, um, you know, they they are university professors. They are high school professors. They are um, they they are lawyers. I mean, they're they're professionals who who know their stuff. They know how to research. Um, they, they've been trained in research methodology too. <laughs> Um, and they make the they make they make the mistakes intentionally because they're building a a certain type of of, of reality for readers and and it's a contemporary mo romance is what it is it's a contemporary romance with carriages and ball gowns mm -hmm. um, so you are free to have the feminist heroine who is warring against the sexist male all you want um, you can have characters a hero and heroine who is fighting for social justice um, you know you you can you can have these elements because you have built an alternate world. You're, you're boldly, it's like, I'm not, I'm not pretending to be a purist. I am boldly coming out there and saying we are modern 
inside this 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 historical setting um and readers who love it love it and 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 whenever you see you know bad reviews for things like that it's because a purist accidentally picked up the book and said what is this she's wearing a fuchsia gown Right. what is this um but then the same thing is going to happen you know if somebody of this genre goes and read one of those those, those purist books and they're gonna say how can you read this what is this, this is archaic language it's like old you know old english or something and you're like oh gosh <laughs> and you call yourself a jane austen fan well i've seen the movies um <laughs> so you know nothing nothing against those those readers but you, you you have you have readers who who favor favor what they favor and then the writers the writers write to those readers if there were no readers who wanted who wanted th th this fantasy land? Then the authors wouldn't write it. Um, it it's all about meeting meeting those those needs. So um, yes, there are there are uh, common mistakes that happen unintentionally. Um, but I'm going to give the credit to a great portion of the authors who they're making these intentionally. <laughs> I I hadn't really considered that there were such varied audiences when i when i think regency stories or regency romance i think that is a segment of readers and it is but i i hadn't realized how how different and how separated the ends of that spectrum were that's that's quite interesting so for people who are interested in maybe maybe they're maybe they are you know they they want that sort of fantasy um but with some hints of of that you know historical um, way of writing so it is you know a lot of things are accurate but then they're intentionally putting in that that feminist heroine or, or what have you um, what are some of the best research methods that you've found because I like I, I I google you know with impunity <laughs> when I'm doing my own research but it is I know it's a weakness of mine to do really deep research into something um, just because I, I don't feel like I was fully given the tools for that so um, what are some pieces of advice? Okay, um, I have a cheat. I have a cheat to give you. And then some genuine research recommendations, um, as well as maybe some like what 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 not to do, but um like the Google. You 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 called it, you called it. But but we'll we'll I'll explain. I'll explain why why the Googling might 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 be a poor poor choice. But I do have a little bit of a cheat. It doesn't always it doesn't always apply, but um one one way that you can kind of cheat is by in a, in a scene focusing on something else bringing the reader's attention to something really specific um so let's say let's say for instance um and i I, I won't i won't call the i won't call the author out um i was reading i was reading um a book the other day and they made mention of um it took the hero 20 minutes to prepare for the ball the first thing he did was order a bath. And I I had to, I had to close the book for a minute. I had to close the book. I had to take some deep, deep breaths. Um, 20 minutes. Like, I mean, that's just like a practical thing. Like how long would it take? For like, you? I didn't even think it would take <laughs> the modern person 20 minutes. Um, I'll make just the bath alone from the ordering of it to stepping out. It's probably going to be two hours. Just, just the bath. Let's not talk about anything else. He's got a shave. I mean, that's a straight razor. It's not like he's got a, I mean, whew, he's got a lot to do. It's going to take a while. Um, but you have that sort of relatability um, factor with the, with the readers too. So, so which way do you go? Do you, do you say he's going to be 20 minutes, um, which would, which would be anachronistic, or do you say it's going to take him, you know, five hours? Um, and, and some readers might be like, yeah, that's, that sounds about right. But most readers, there's that believability aspect where it's like, I, I don't know if I can really get behind it taking that long. Um, so instead, you just kind of sidestep it, and you you it don't you don't say. It. Instead, you focus on some aspect of him getting ready. So um, you you can show you can slow it down and show that he's taken this long process to choose his cravat. He he chooses it. He chooses it. His 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 valet tries to tries to tie it. He doesn't like it. We have to throw it out. He he tries another one. Maybe the scented handkerchief. He goes through 10 different scented hangers and you, and you slow this down. In this moment, you get this nice, deep point of view. Um, this nice, deep, deep perspective. You get to know him a little bit better. Um, you get to know the era a little bit better and what what 
mattered, what was of value, um, especially if he's going to a uh, to a ball. What does he know people are going to pay attention to? Um, and we never we never even touch on how long it took him to get ready. In our mind, all we knew is it took him ten hours to choose the silly cravat. So who knows how long it you know? But but um, you you can you can sidestep some of these by just not being as specific as you should. Um, but let's say you actually want to do some real research. Well, hopefully you will. Um, what you don't want to do is open up the Google browser and and say something like, how long did it take for the gentleman to get ready for the ball? Um, so what what happens with that, um, if we if we take a few steps back, some author somewhere, uh, Jane Jones, um, decided to start a research blog, started an author blog, and she couldn't find the information. So she put on there um, that it's going to take a hero probably about two hours um, to get ready for the ball. So um, Jonah Smith wants to write a book. She wants to do some research. She opens up Google. Um, the first blog that comes up, you know, J Jane Jones has great SEO. Um, so her, her search engine optimization, she's, she's right up the top. She is the top click. Um, Jonah Smith goes to do her research. The first one there, it takes two hours to get ready. And she goes, oh, well, Jane Jones did her research. So this must be right. So I'm going to put it in my research blog. So then when, you know, um, uh, Cedric Brown decides to write his Regency romance, um, he goes into Google and by golly, the first 50 blogs all say the same thing. It takes that hero two hours. Now, 50 blogs can't be wrong. The 50 blogs all got their information from Jane Jones. Jane Jones made it up. Um, and it's not malicious, but the misinformation spreads and it spreads quickly. And you might get some outlier who says that it's going to take them, I don't know, five hours. Um, and it's like, well, that can't be right. That's that's only one. That's only one one author and these 50 others. So um, you end up going down a rabbit hole of, of misinformation. Mm -hmm. Um, stay away from stay away from the Google. Stay away oh, from how the frustrating. I mean, I I, search. I at least try to corroborate. Like it's not just one person right. saying this. You and know, as an answer on some forum. You know, I'm, like I I try to corroborate, but that that of course would make sense. Well, oh, how disappointing. Okay, so so what so help do? help out a poor, you, you know, less than research savvy, evidently. Um, person. Okay, so the bad news is you're going to have to do some reading. You're going to have to do some serious reading. <laughs> um, there are three layers that I would recommend. Um, <laughs> step one, step one is really, you could stop at step one if you wanted to. Uh, but if you wanted to, to, to go further, you're going to do all three steps. Um, step one is forget all this, this, this modern scholarship and people writing about the time, read the time. Um, so we're, we're, we're talking, um, you're, you're, you're going to read, um, behold, I have examples. I have examples. I didn't know how I would use them, but let's pull some of these examples. You're going to read the letters of the time. So Jane Austen writing to her, her sister, Cassandra, um, you're going to read the letters of the time. Um, that's going to that's going to inform so much. You get the voice of the era. You get what was important. You get references to events and people, what they thought, perspectives, um, everything. Uh, Jane Austen might even mention uh, the, the the cost of writing a letter. Uh, and you're going, oh, well, that's interesting. I just learned something about the cost of writing a letter. Um, you've got you've got all of these these. Uh, I, Clergymen loved to 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 write in their diaries. That was like the clergyman thing. I guess they had a lot of time on their hands. I don't know, but there are so many um, journals that uh, say the country parson wrote. And oh, that's and George Herbert. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many of these. I mean, um, pick on pick on maybe James James Woodford. Um, I can't say that some of these are the most riveting reads, but um, I mean, they had their daily schedule down. You can know exactly mm. what they did, when they did, and how they did it. What they thought when they ran into some some stranger. What they thought when they heard about some scandal. They've got it. They've got it all. They've got it all written. So read the stuff of read the stuff of the time. The newspaper archives. 
Um, the old Bailey has 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 the legal court cases. Um, you can see what was happening and what wasn't. You can see what um, what the penalties were, what the what, what, what crimes were brought to the court, and what were they? They still have um, the the old Bailey records from oh, yes. that time. Oh, oh yeah, I'm a big Tale um, of Two Cities fan, so that just that warms my heart. <laughs> you can and it's so easy to search and, and like the genealogy and, and there, there's so much there's so much to search. We also have what else do I have over here? Oh, um, they have a lot of like say say nonfiction books, um, that you can reference. So let's say this one. Oh, a nice nice blank page. That's really helpful. Um, this one was a guide on the duties of a lady's maid. It was a, it was, it, so if you were going to be a lady's maid, you would, you would, you, you would actually get this. got that, you would get this, and this would teach you how to do your job. Hmm. Um, so learning about that, you learn about the servants, you learn about what they, what they should and shouldn't do, what their, what their duties are, what their, their roles are. Here's one, um, the complete servant. Oh, wow. This was written in 1826. So it's a little bit, a little bit late, but, um, but still in touch with that the time like whoever wrote it would know people who who were more squarely regency uh it's still yeah it's coming from it, that it's coming from that right era. read the fiction of the time um i mean that's a great that's a great choice nobody uh, well hey tom jones is good i was like what am i holding tom tom jones tom jones is fine you could be a real tom jones um read the read the fiction of the times the, the more you read of the times the 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 better you get um, the, the big picture of what was happening, what wasn't happening, um, the, the, the culture, uh, just, just, you, you get a real sense of it. So that would be, that would be layer one, um, read the time itself. Uh, this is something that say a fantasy writer, a true fantasy writer, we're not talking to like, like, you know, modern regions here, but, but a true fantasy making their own world, they can't say, go back and, and read, um, the era because it's a made up era so so we we have this advantage if we're if we're dealing with real history we do have the real history that we can that we can work with and manipulate hmm. um and then layer two would be uh, of course the scholarship the scholarship of people who are writing about it researching about it studying it um but i emphasize scholarship the scholars not the bloggers and this is not a knock to my own blog i have my own author blog um but uh this this isn't like calling me out but <laughs> stay away from the blogs um <laughs> you you want the true scholarship so so by scholarship are I we mean, talking like jstor um exactly. that sort of thing okay yes we're talking the peer reviewed journals we're talking the articles that are from the peer reviewed journals so the article so let's say a book a book um, they've got these great reference books out there that talk about the Georgian era or this, that, or another, and that's awesome. I would look at the bio of the person, see if see if they're legit and what else they have published, because anybody can publish a book. Um, but when it comes to those those articles, like that are on JSTOR, and JSTOR is my favorite. Um, so hey, plug plug, get yourself a JSTOR subscription, um, and you can even with a lot of um, a lot of libraries around here, especially university libraries, even if you're not a student or anything, um, a lot of them will offer a day pass and mm -hmm. you can go there and get a day pass and get, get like bring your research notes and, and get all of the, the JSTOR articles you want without actually having to pay for the subscription. So there's a little, there's a little cheat for the researchers who want it, but don't want to pay or can't pay the, the, the subscription costs. But, um, Jaster is a good one. Um, so the yeah, these articles are are peer reviewed, and that means that you have a committee, not one guy, not two guys. You have an entire committee of experts in the field who are checking mm -hmm. if what they have written is legitimate, if it squares. They're cross referencing. They're they're looking at the at the at the writer's um, research and making sure they didn't make it up. It's amazing how many people will make it up. You know, you look at a a, a book that seems great. You look at their bibliography and. Um, half the stuff it doesn't doesn't exist <laughs> like did you really did you really yes they did that's um, horrifying so that shouldn't happen because you have so no, many people double checking it, 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 it should it should period but um it's definitely not going to happen in a in a in a peer reviewed journal um so you get the, the folks that are that are devoting their lives to 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 this kind of scholarship um and let's say you find an article so that would be level two you find the scholarship. Um, level three would be you find an article that you like, you like what it's talking about, look at their bibliography. So they've already done the research. 
um, they have created a shortcut for you. Check out their bibliography, and that's going to lead you to more topics on on the same more more articles on the same subject um, because they've already done the research for you. Uh, now, obviously, you want to you know go and do your own, but um, how great you right. Got but it. if you're starting from scratch, then yes. if you find something that has the information you're looking for, how perfect that it would lead you to the next um, kind of you step. Go down that rabbit perfect. hole. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not saying that everything you read out of a journal article is going to be is going to be true. There's plenty of contention, especially when it comes to any kind of analysis, um, any kind of interpretation of, of history. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to have contention. You're going to have somebody writing in their article that it was this way, somebody else arguing that it wasn't. Um, but at least you know that they have analyzed and researched it, you know, so thoroughly, so accurately, um, their interpretation just might be a little different than, 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 than others. So, you know, you're reading it with a grain of salt, but at least you know that it's legit. So that would be my recommendation to new authors. It's it's a long it's a long road. I mean, if you want, you could just open up your Word document and start typing because you have a passion for typing. Um, but it kind of comes down to how many anachronisms are you okay with? How many misrepresentations are you okay with? Um, and that's really just it's really just a choice. Do you think it's possible to um so say say I do want to write a uh regency style romance and have most everything be historically accurate um do you think it's possible to kind of begin and then just be very aware to you know flag certain things and then do research as I go or I, I know it's not ideal obviously because you want to start from a place of knowing what the etiquette is and things like that so it can inform your story decisions but for somebody who's brand new is that a way that you can kind of um you know have have that have the writing fun as you are building up that research muscle oh definitely oh definitely like know at least enough to get started I um, mean if you don't know enough to get started why are you even writing in the genre um, and, and knowing enough, honestly, could just come from you've read so many of these, you feel like you're part of the culture. Yeah. Um, but but start writing because I mean that's the whole point of you of you even getting into this. I mean research isn't fun, and and you could well I mean some of us think it's fun, but but generally speaking, <laughs> some of it's speaking, fun, some of it. <laughs> um, some of us who really dig it just kept digging it. Um, but uh, to, to to most people, research isn't going to be fun. They they want to get into the writing, and and if you get bogged down by the research, not only have you wasted writing time, but you may not write um all that all that that excitement just sort of sort of drains out so right it can become writing. overwhelming because it's a it's a black yes. hole you can always learn more like you said you at the beginning you don't so, know yeah and then you're right you don't know what you don't know until you start down that path and it can um so you so you good. said write or i'm sorry read um material from the time itself um scholarly articles did you say there were three kind of layers Yes, um, uh, scholarly articles and the bibliography, um, the bibliography of. Oh, the okay, that was the that was the third one. Just wanted to make sure cheat. I didn't. Uh, I the unofficial. That's, that's hardly that's hardly cheating. It's just like using good maneuvering sense. tactics. I think. Right, it's good sense, but um, you know, I think, and and this is really the benefit of having multiple drafts. You know, get the story out. It's full of anachronisms. It's full of forms of address issues, and it's like, who cares? It's a draft. Um, and, and once you have it, then it's kind of like, you know what to research then. It's like, you know what? I may have described their bonnet incorrectly. You know what? I may have these forms of address. And then as you're researching, it, it's it's with intention and then you can apply it um, immediately. And then you're going to remember it for next time. Um, in every book, every book I write, I learn something new. And every time I learn something new, I realize all the mistakes that were in the previous books. So it, <laughs> it, it, it becomes this sort of like, um, if we're going to pick on the roses, it's like, you're going to find roses, roses in the garden in this, in this book, this book, this book. And then all of a sudden we stop mentioning roses because apparently I learned, <laughs> I learned about the roses after that point. But I feel like that's process. one of the, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing to look at earlier, you know, stories. Uh, I, I've, I have, um, yeah, when I when I look at my earlier stuff, I still love it, but I see things now, and that and it's a it's a evidence of growth, right? Yes, <clears throat> we can see exactly. things now, whether it's storytelling things or you know historically accurate or inaccurate things that we just didn't know before. So we put that positive right. spin on it, move forward, and and just grow from wherever we are. So that's my be proud. Philosophy. Be proud. It is it is it is evidence of improvement. Yes, exactly, exactly. 
Um, so to go back to um, some more specifics here, um, Jane Austen, who again, poster child of of the the Regency, even if there's you know only some overlap, um, she writes about upper class characters and gentry. Mostly, we don't really talk to lower class characters or encounter them much in in her work. So, can you explain a little bit about how? classes at the time were divided. I know you mentioned some um, succession rules and things like that, but was it was it money? Was it title? Was it land? Like, what was it that actually divided um, the classes and what did that look like? Okay. Um, I do think we need to sort of rethink how how we approach uh, the idea of a of a class system. Okay, um, perfect. And and especially when you, know, you mentioned you mentioned the money, um, um rethink things being divided by money so um this was an agrarian society and it was it was the last agrarian society before we enter industrialism industrialism was coin based the agrarian society is not coin based um so there can be this easy misconception that we've got this division of of money this this division of um who had it and who didn't um and that wasn't actually the case um it was there was an element of wealth, certainly, but wealth didn't necessarily mean money. Um, so wealth referred to assets. Assets specifically are land and lineage. Money itself, um, this is before industrialism and industrialism, yeah, you know, like 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 we get to the Victorian era and then enter industrialism and we start having class structures, a coin-based system, coin-based economy. Um, but at the time, um, money was completely vulgar. It was absolutely vulgar. Uh, making money um, is about the worst thing that you could you you could do. Um, making money meant you were lower class. Um, talking about money meant you were lower class. Any kind of obsession over money is is, is lower class. Um, so you could have a poverty stricken aristocrat, and he's still going to be considered that sort of upper class. He wouldn't consider him upper class because we don't have that class that class division vision not yet that that's that's kind of a 19th 20th century um late 19th and an early 20th century concept but so um, it's the lineage and the title community. that would confer that more than any kind of assets you might own. right right so well um uh his assets would be land and lineage um so so hang in there so he's wealthy he's wealthy but not not by coin so you can have poverty stricken and, he, and he's still going to be he's still going to be the member of the other uh, upper class because he has land and lineage um you could be a wealthy merchant, the wealthiest merchant in all of England, and you're still going to be lower class. And you're going to be mm -hmm. lower class because instead of land and lineage, you have coin. And coin is lower class. Um, and if we if we take a little flashback to Pride and Prejudice, and we can hear Mrs. Bennett, and she's going on and on about, you know, um, uh, throwing the ladies, uh, you know, at other rich men and, and, oh, he's got an income of such and such. Mrs. Bennett, bless her heart, is obsessed with money. And she talks about it and she talks about it and she talks about it. Um, and we can see there's many reasons why Darcy's reluctant, but we can, we can see why he might be reluctant for an alliance. Because even though Elizabeth Bennett's mother or father was a gentleman, and they were technically thus gentry, um, the mother was lower class and she showed it. She showed it with her talk of, of money. Um, mm -hmm. So Darcy would be allying himself with, with a lower class just, just from the mother's uh, perspective. So I think, I think instead, of, instead of thinking of class, let's think of it as ranks. Um, mm -hmm. What determined your rank were the three L's, land, lineage, labor. Land, lineage, so which one of these you had determined where you ranked. Um, you could have a combination that determined where you were ranked. So the top two, the top two uh, ranks that we that we consider are aristocrats and then commoners. Well not top two. They're the only two. The only two. The only two we have. So there's not there's not upper class, middle class, lower class. There is aristocrats and then there's everyone else. So um, gentry would be aristocrats then? Nope, or nope. they would be the Gentry common, would be considered commoners. The um, commoners, okay. Yep, yep, yeah. So bear with me. So bear with me. Aristocrats have the land and the lineage, and that's that's what their 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 rank is. Aristocrats they have the land and the lineage. Um, they have it because of their title. They get a title because of it. Um, it is a symbiotic relationship. They they land and lineage. Commoners are going to have either land 
or lineage or labor. And then that divides the commoners. So then you have gentry. Their gentry is considered a commoner because um, they don't have land and lineage. They typically just have the land. Because they have the land, that separates them from the laborers. They don't labor. The gentry doesn't labor. If they were to labor, if they were ever out there to, to, to wield a trade or start earning money, um, then they're they're out. They're they're going to be considered a laborer, and they're no longer part of that that gentry um, division um, classification. So okay, I've heard the term landed labor. gentry. So I guess that that makes more sense now. Okay. Yep. So that's that's what they have. That's what they have. Uh, to their name is is land. You have land and lineage. You're an aristocrat. You have land. You're gentry. You labor for your money. You are a laborer. Now the laborer class can be you know separated even even further. But um, let's let's um, Let's look at the, the the gentry for a, for a second here, um, and that concept of a profession, having a profession. I think that'll help the the, the laborers make a little bit more sense. Um, so, as a gentleman, if you're if you're if you're a member of gentry, you're a gentleman. And now, being a gentleman was like this is a classification. This isn't like oh, you're such a gentleman, you open the door for me. Um, this had nothing to do with good manners at all. This had nothing to do with behavior. Um, you could be the roguish, rudish, rudest um, gentleman on earth, uh, but you could still be a gentleman. So being a gentleman was a, a classification in and of itself. Gentleman equals gentry. It's 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 synonymous. Um, and this means that um, you didn't you didn't earn you didn't work to earn money you didn't wield a trade so did you have coin sure but you didn't earn it through a trade so perhaps you earned your money through an inheritance perhaps it was a trust fund perhaps there's um money from tenants um the produce from your farmlands so Sure, coin is coming in, but you haven't earned it by wielding any sort of trade. Um, there were four professions that you could have uh, and still be considered a gentleman. And there were also four, these, these same four professions are the ones that um, the younger sons of aristocrats could enter, and they would still be considered gentlemen because these four professions still didn't, they, they still didn't wield a trade and they still didn't earn direct money. Hmm. Gen, uh, clergymen. Barrister, military officer, and physician. And you think, oh, well, these are big earners. They never receive a salary. Um, it is, it, it, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting to look back and see what they did receive because it sure wasn't a salary. Um, they might, so let's say the barrister, they might receive a gift of money for helping in a particular case. Right, which um, is a type of lawyer for anybody who's not aware of that, who's watching. Oh yes, okay, yeah. So, so the barrister is the one with the white wig and 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 the 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 black cloak thing. Um, and he actually goes into court and he speaks to the judge. Um, the solicitor is the clerk who deals with the clients. The barrister never talks to clients. Um, he is he's the highest lawyer that you can you can think of. Um, and you're 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 like a oh, high lawyer makes a lot of money. Well, at the time, not. Um, and that's what made him a gentleman. He didn't earn any money. Um, for his efforts, he might even earn something like, um, hey, my client is a blacksmith and he says he'll shoe your horses for free for a year. You know, and you can have this sort of trade and barter system um, happening where no coin was exchanged. But even if coin is exchanged, it's it's a gift. I mean, if this guy wants to gift me money, sure, I'll take your money. Um, but I didn't really do anything for it. And so you've got you, you've got a lot of ways where they're they're still earning earning money or they're earning something um, in place of it. So even the tithes for the, the, the clergymen, you know, they could, instead of actually getting coin um, as they're collecting the taxes, um, they could get produce. Um, they could get something in exchange. So anybody with those four professions, they can still be, they can still be gentry. Um, but if you labor, if you actually labor, if you are earning a salary, you cannot be a gentleman. You are a laborer and you earn money. Um, and then that goes back to those, the, you know, the three L's, land, lineage, or labor. You are labor if you earn money. It, if you have land and lineage and you labor, you have just negated the land and the lineage. Like it was so labor, any kind of earning money, money was so hated. Um, it, it, it was not it wasn't hated. It was, um, it just, it didn't have a place in the society. So, um, it was so not valued that the land and the lineage could actually be neg negated by by performing labor, um, and and I mean, you could perform perform physical labor. Like labor isn't 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 referring to like you're pouring over the anvil. You're you're um, 
it's it's anything that earns money, anything. So the solicitor. Um, I mean, he's sitting at a desk all day. He's not, you're not at, at an anvil or 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 farming or um, he's sitting at a desk all day. But he's he's earning steady money, um, and that that considers him a, a laborer. Hmm. Um, so when we think of of, of class, um, think of money versus assets, and and assets is wealth. That's not um, not money. Um, so good land and lineage. You're you're an aristocrat or upper class. Good land or lineage and your gentry or middle class um labor for money your lower class hmm. uh these classes this wasn't really part of your question but i i think it i think it is kind of important for us to know um they you you socialize you socialize with with you're just thinking of that division that that idea of 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 them being divisive, um, the, these classes being devices, divisive. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's so much that uh, we can associate with as you socialize with your with with your your peers. You socialize um, with folks who have something in common with you. You who who have shared interests, shared perspectives, shared hobbies, shared pastimes. Um, who you see every day, who you work with every day. Um, those are the so it's just that you're more likely with. to associate with people in the same rank or whatever, just because right. Right. You, that's, an I mean, that's kind of how, how things often shake out today. You know, you hang out with people who are kind exactly. of at the same spot in life, um, whatever that, whatever that may mean. Exactly. Okay. And it's not to say that there's not, you know, some snobbery involved. Uh, my lineage is better than yours, so I'm not going to associate with you. I mean, you know, it's there. It's still, it's still there. It's still there today. Um, right. Human nature. But, <laughs> it's, you know, uh, it's not that much vastly different. Oh, right, right. <laughs> but um, I, I would say the, the majority isn't going to be some form of snobbery. It, it, it's really formed of it, like who you're associated with. Um, and you can even break it down. It's not just the aristocrats associating with aristocrats or gentry associating with gentry um, or laborers associating with laborers. I mean, you also have like townies are going to associate with townies. Um, they're going to go out in the country and be like, I don't even understand what you're saying, much less your behavior. I don't understand this etiquette. I, what do you do for fun? Um, <laughs> And then, and then the reverse is true. Villagers are going to associate with villagers. It's 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 who you're around and the people you know and the things that you associate with, um, and and what you have what you have in common. Um, and you know what? Yeah, you teach high school. It's a bit like it's, these these um the, the the high school cliques. So the artists hang out with the artists, the jocks hang out with the jocks, and that is not saying that the artist and the jock can be friends. It's just saying that it's not as likely and there could be some discomfort involved. So the jock invites an artist to the party and the artist, maybe he knows a lot about cricket, but everybody wants to talk football. Well, he's not a jock. He doesn't follow sports all that much. Um, and he's just sitting there, not talking to anybody going, why am I here? And right. You wouldn't have this, all the same shorthand necessarily. And. Yeah, like I mean, even slang, the slang that they're going to use, the 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 idioms that they use, um, what they consider to be fun. Not to pick on jocks, but maybe they all want to open the keg, and the artist is going, "Ooh, must we? I'm not really into that. Um, let's watch Pride and Prejudice instead." You know, so <laughs> just different, you know, different interests. Uh, so I, I I think when you know when we're when we're looking at the the, the class breakdown, it's it's. Um, we've got we've got people who have a shared lineage, people who have something in common. They can talk about land, you know, or you have the laborers. They have the day, same same daily schedule that they can they can share. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's something that's that's snobbish. Um, and somewhere <laughs> someone is is raising their fist, going, "No, no, this is you know an evil classes system." I'm like, well, I guess, but I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks for thanks for kind of breaking down some of those nuances because often it's it, it, we we are so used to seeing things from our own perspectives and you know in the in the media that we take in and our own life experience that it, it's easy to just not even consider that that money was vulgar just period because obviously that's not um, really the the world that we currently live in my. Final question is, uh, can you explain a bit how about how courtship and marriage worked at the time? And I know that, that it'd be easy to, you know, 
really get into the nitty gritty of this. I know that you've looked into it very deeply, but um, just kind of broad strokes, what are some of the things people need to understand about how courtship and marriage functioned at the time? I'll paint a nice, a nice picture, a nice okay. picture of, of the, the marrying for love and, 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 and what, what all that might entail, or if there are better ways or different ways, or what happens if you don't marry for, for love. Um, and we'll kind of dig in there and see if, see if we want to expound on any of the, any of the points. Um, so yeah, so the Regency romance um, genre, it's, it's, it's like, we're obsessed. We're obsessed with love. We're obsessed with that moment, you know, when, when we can slow down the world and and relive the the whole courtship process, the falling in love, the actual you know not the day to day life where okay I love them, um, but no that 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 do I or don't I and and do I make this choice and and Jane Austen was if you want to look at it that way obsessed too that's what all of her her books are focused on I mean her, her her books are focused on a great many other things um, but that that's really our our, our modern takeaway is um, is all of these characters were marrying for love. So I do think that there is a misconception. Um, and I guess maybe that's kind of what, what folks need to know, if you want to really need to know something, um, a misconception that uh, people of the time weren't marrying for love, when I would honestly say that the majority were. There are plenty of outliers. There are plenty of um, exceptions to that rule, but I would say the majority were. But what does love mean? So that's where that's where things get a little bit get a little bit tricky. Is I think the definition of love, the definition of love in the Georgian era, is a little different than it is now. Um, so this kind of goes back to the age of enlightenment when I said how much I how much I loved this era, um, basically because of the age of enlightenment. Um, and the, the idea of sense being more important than sensibility. Um, sensibility gets you in trouble. So it's reason over emotion. Does this mean that you should make a, you know, prudent, reasonable marriage instead of say an emotional marriage? No, no, no. So here, here, here we, here's, here's what we need to, here's what we really need to know. Um, it's the difference between, and there's a, there's a big distinction between true love and romantic love. Um, hmm. You were talking about the eras and your, your, your focus was on literary eras. The romantic era hadn't happened yet. Uh, most of our concept of, of love comes from the Romantic era. Um, and it was it was one of those where it was it was getting started and it was gaining speed, but it wasn't fully here yet. And it was almost like in Jane Austen's books, she's going, oh my gosh, no, help, help, what's happening? Um, we've got to stop this, <laughs> put the brakes on. So we see, we, just see, we see the distinction between true love and romantic love. So romantic love, is lust. Um, it's it's you you are fueled by physical attraction. You are fueled by an emotional attraction. Um, should you be physically attracted to your mate? Should you be emotionally attracted to your mate? Yes, but there has to be more than that. So when you're thinking of romantic love, that's all there is. You have that immediate physical draw. You have that immediate emotional draw. You feel so connected to the person um, and, and you jump on that. And, and if that's your basis for um, a relationship, then you're in trouble. So you have to, you have to stop and you have to, you have to say, is there more to this? Is this going to be a stable relationship? Is it going to be long lasting? Is there happiness in there? Um, do we have shared common, um, uh, shared traits, shared interests? Um, our family is going to get along. There's so, so many practical manners and every single heroine that she has, um, that Jane Austen has is, is showing that, that rational reasoning, the, 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 the practical approach, as well as say, um, the physical appreciation, um, or the emotional connection, but, but every single one of them, um, even if they're being drawn to the wrong person, as soon as they start thinking about this rationally, they're like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, so then we know that every relationship um, that her heroes and heroines um, uh, have are going to be long lasting and going to be stable and going to be happy because they have focused on true love, deep love, 
something that goes far beyond the physical. Um, they have established that rather than the lustful romantic love. And any any example, she's got plenty of examples, of course, of, of romantic love. And anytime you have those examples, that's when everything goes wrong. So romantic love, that that that, that lust, um, where you're fueled by emotion and physical only. Um, we see that in Marianne Dashwood um, and Willoughby and how terribly wrong that goes. Um, Mariah Bertram and Henry Crawford in Mansfield, Mansfield Park, that goes really wrong. Um, we see- um, Lydia and Wickham. Thank you, thank you, Lydia, Lydia Bennett, and and good old good old Mr. Wickham. I can't even think of his first name at the moment. Bless his heart. Um, fit, no, uh, no idea. So, Mr. Wickham, um, Lydia and Wickham. I mean that that physical physical lust gone wrong. Um, Georgina Darcy and Wickham. Speaking of Wickham and his dastardly deeds, I mean every everybody associated with the guy. They're like, man, he's hot. Um, and and it's like, well, that's where that's where <laughs> that's your undoing right now. You are you are dealing with emotion. You need to be dealing with 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 you know rational thought. Um, but there is also a a, a warning against um, completely practical. We mm -hmm. want true love, so we want both. We want both. Uh, we want the the physical and the emotional. But it has to be decided practically and 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 rationally. Um, if you choose just practical, and you you get rid of the emotional, then you end up with Charlotte Lucas and Mr. Collins. Um, so she does have she does have couples that that show that. Well, Mariah Bertram and uh, what's his name, Mr. Mr. Rutherford, Rutherford, Rutherfield, Rutherford, Rutherford. Rutherford, Rushfield. No, it no idea. Been a very long time. It's been a very long time. Park, so um, Poor Mansfield <laughs> Park. It's like the one that that nobody talks about. I didn't um, like it's really poor Fanny. <laughs> poor Fanny. Um, so, uh, yeah. So anyway, who, who, Rushford? No, whatever. So what, whatever his name was. Um, and she made a completely practical choice and then that ended up, you know, being the undoing and then she followed her emotion. It's like she, she's going the, the wrong way. The, 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 completely, the completely practical and the completely emotional. It's like, woman, would you just <laughs> use your sense, use your senses, you know? Um, so uh, I, I think this kind of works us works us to what about arranged marriages? If everybody's marrying for love in a time when you're not supposed to marry for love, um, what about arranged marriages? And I would kind of like to I like us to think of arranged marriages as being a little bit different than what we might think of them as. Sure, there's going to be some that are betrothed from the cradle. Um, there's going to be some that are required, but I'm going to say that they're uncommon. Um, I like to think of arranged marriages more as matchmaking. You've got parents and guardians who want the best for, well, no, let's not, let's not do that to get that, that opens a different can of worms. Um, they want the best suitor. There we go. They don't necessarily want the best for their, their, their children or, or ward. Sorry. Um, uh, it would be nice if they did, but, uh, so they want the best suitor. So in, instead of taking a naive girl um, and, and letting her loose on the world, and she knows absolutely nothing about anybody. She doesn't know who the rakes are. She doesn't know who, who has a good reputation. She doesn't know anything. Um, and if a fortune hunter comes her way, I mean, she wouldn't know him from Adam. So you, you, you get the people who do know these things who are going to vet the suitors, and they're going to say, here are the five guys that I would recommend based on their, their, their lineage, their land. That goes back to, goes back to those, the, 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 the wealth, the, the lineage, the land, um, the family that we might want to be associated with, um, a good reputation. Mm -hmm. um they represent good tone uh, <laughs> so they can provide security like you know all the all the things that you would you would want to go through um they they check those boxes and they say here are the five that i would recommend um and then from there it's really the young lady's choice of of who has that connection but we've got the practical side and then we've got that that connection side and you can't always trust your your parent or guardian's um, choices either um, cough cough Mrs. Bennett throwing everyone at, at at good old Wickham you know like like sometimes you gotta you gotta use your noggin and say maybe mm -hmm. thanks for your thanks for your recommendations but maybe not um, but uh, I, I like to think of the arranged marriages as being a, a a form of a form of matchmaking for the naive girls mm -hmm. um, and speaking of of naive girls if if we put 
the challenge of this. Like, it seems so easy. It seems so easy of, of okay, so I'm going to think rationally while also thinking with my heart, um, trying to trying to connect those. That seems easy. But if you put it in the perspective of these young ladies who have never been out of the schoolroom, um, that can be challenging. That can be overwhelming. Um, that can be scary, especially whenever you have someone like Willoughby making the moves. Um, and nobody was since telling you not to, you know, follow, follow Willoughby's mm -hmm. flirtation. Um, but the, the, the young ladies before their, before their season, before their, before they come out, out in society, um, they are literally stuck in the schoolroom learning to be young ladies and so restricted. So they can't, they can't travel unless they're, they're going to see family with family. Um, they can't go to parties. They can't dance. They can't um, do afternoon calls. They, they, it's off to bed before the festivities begin. Um, I mean, they, they are, they have no, no company other than family and immediate neighbors. I mean, they're, they are completely sheltered. And then you have this come out where it's like, there, there's no transition. It's ta-da, welcome to the world. Welcome to society. Oh, and here are all these lovely would, boats. Um girls be for that you know coming out into society moment would it be like 16 or or thereabouts oh um okay so when when there, there's not necessarily an age it's whenever your 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 parent or guardian decides it um oh, okay. and and being out is really nothing more than them saying they're out um and being out is is not just to do with marriage i mean that's mostly the the, the point but it's also to do with they are out in society so they're able to participate in society. They can make the afternoon calls. They can attend the parties, um, meet the officers when they come. Um, you know, they can dance at the village assemblies because before then they they, they can't. So the the age is up for grabs. Um, you could have some folks that are you know nineteen and twenty and they're making their debut. You can have some that are fifteen and sixteen, um, and they're making their debut. And and <laughs> I guess it really depends on how quickly they want to get them married and, and, and out, but, um, I wouldn't put a definitive age on it. It is up to the parent or guardian, whatever they, whatever they think. Um, so yeah, imagine you are say a 15, 16 year old girl who's been sheltered all this time. You have no exposure. Um, and all of a sudden there's this, this wonderful world. You can, you can go to the parties and meet the, meet the gentlemen and, and visit people and travel and just do all the things and do all the shopping. And, 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 and somewhere someone is telling you to think with your head. <laughs> it's like, how? <laughs> I'm starry eyed and dazzled. Right. Um, that would be, that would be really hard unless you had a good solid group of friends who could see fairly clearly you know and you could bounce the ideas off of that that would be challenging and they're not going to lead you astray it's so easy right. to fall for say the willoughby nobody's warned you otherwise um right or even if you have been warned otherwise when you actually meet someone face to face it's it, it feels different you know if you've been sheltered for that long mm -hmm. you were definitely not prepared and um this this is contentious this is contentious but but bear with me Marriage itself, the idea, so, so they're out in society and, and society itself is overwhelming, but the, but the idea of, 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 of marriage can be so intoxicating. Um, you know, I think now looking, looking back on it, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say, oh, but you know, to say the, the, the women were, uh, you know, oppressed and, and, and property and, but we've got to, we've got to look at it from the Georgian perspective. We got to look at it from the Georgian perspective of the ladies having their, their debut and marriage, marriage meant freedom. The whole idea of marriage was exciting. So when you're living, you're living at home and all you do all day is sit in your bedroom, reading ladies mag magazines and you can't go to the parties um, and you have to obey them uh, no matter what. And you have no say in anything. The idea of being the lady of the manor, the idea of being the mistress of the household, hmm. that comes with. It's a right, huge but, step up from what your previous experience. Hmm. Yes. Like. You can choose the menu. You you do choose the menu. This is part of your role. This is part of your duties. You choose what you choose what everybody eats in the household. Um, maybe that doesn't sound like a big thing. It's a big thing. <laughs> um, you can choose how to decorate the house. You can choose which friends and and family and neighbors you associate with and and who you don't. Mm -hmm. um, you can you can choose um, you know who you're going to call on and and who you don't. Um, your daily schedule is your own. You choose what games they play um, after 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 dinner, um, and I realize you know the husband might have have some might have more say than 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 others feel, but but 
the mind of the mind of 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 the girl and her come out in society this is what she's thinking of i'm going to be mistress of that household and i'm going to have all the power hmm. and i'm going to have all the freedom uh, and there's other perks i mean she might get a new wardrobe she might get access to a carriage her own carriage when she wants it depending on obviously who who, who she's marrying um children uh hopefully a really nice lifelong companion that's up for grabs but that would be really nice like this is pretty enticing um a friend for life who looks like Mr. Darcy, I'll take him. Um, not turning that down. New friends, like the, you get to participate in society, and so this is this is all so exciting. So amid amidst all that, then you say, remember to use your head. <laughs> um, that that really does put it more in in perspective because we do we do look back and and you know focus on the, the lack of rights and the the restrictions and and rightly so in some contexts, but that that makes so much more sense why people would just be chomping at the bit to find that find that partner and move to that manner and and all of that that's that's a it's a valuable perspective especially moments. for people who are writing these these romances yeah. you get to relive that over and over again <laughs> <laughs> yeah so speaking of how can people find you and your work um online if they also like this genre Right. Uh, the best place to start is my website. Um, my website has all of my books listed, uh, as well as where to buy them, which is basically Amazon and other major retailers like Barnes and Noble. Um, but also has bonus material. Uh, if you want me to be a, a guest for a um, say a book club, uh, it's got information on how to make that happen as well as a form. Um, it does have, we were talking about the research blogs and since I have bashed author research blogs, um, here I am going to make a plug for one, you know, <laughs> you use your own, your own discretion here. Uh, but I do have, I have two research blogs. Um, one is the more in-depth sort of like what I'm researching for the certain books for specific books. So it can get really, it can really get really specific. Um, and that's, that's the big research blog. And, you know, it's, it's like the 15, 20 minute reads, um, delving pretty deeply and then I have the fast facts and the fast facts are like did they have roses or not you know it, it um when was wisteria introduced into the regency era or, or the georgian era um whatever the case may may be um <clears throat> so you've got the fast facts then you've got the full the full-blown research section um, and you can find those links kind of through fun, your primary awesome. website through the through the website right so right there at the you go to the website and right there at the the top um nav bar the the Top little toolbar there it'll say say research and then you got the research and the fast fast facts but um yeah I, and i'm very active on social media um more so on instagram than any of the others but um i am on facebook and x formerly known as twitter um so instagram facebook and and x is where you can where you can find me and i check those pretty much daily um pretty much is it daily. the same handle for all three i'll put all the all the oh. links down below for people oh, who yes are. they are and it's just at Paulette Golden. Um, check the spelling. My first name is a little, a little unusual in the, in, the, in the spelling. And in fact, if you're watching the inter interview, you should be able to see on the bottom of my screen there, it says Paulette Golden with the correct spelling. Um, so if you can squint and see, you know, Paulette Golden, it, it has the correct spelling. That's the same with the website. It's paulettegolden.com. I don't vary things up much. It's just... No, I mean, if you have a unique name, name I, I say take advantage of it. <laughs> right like it should be the pen name and no it's 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 my name <laughs> okay all right well yeah definitely check out um all of this additional research that um paulette has put together as well as her many books uh that are available on amazon and elsewhere again all of those links will be down below for people who want to dive deeper um paulette thank you so much for spending the afternoon with me and and uh teaching me all about the Regency era and things that I didn't even know I had wrong. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully it was fun. I'm, I'm a little, a little giddy, a little, you know, overly caffeinated at all times. <laughs> so you know, I found it fascinating. Fun. So, so thank you for joining me and for people out there watching, check out Paulette, like this video if you like it and uh, make sure to subscribe for more writing, publishing and indie author life stuff. Um, until next time, bye.